Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. New on Curiosity Stream. I'm James Burke. I'm going to take you on a journey through time. James Burke's visionary series returns, reimagined for our time. Now, this is all uncharted territory. The Washington Post hails Burke as one of the most intriguing minds in the Western world. The New York Times raves he careens from one great moment in history to another. Where do we want to go from here? Experience all new connections. So what's the next connection? With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. Stove Leg Media, igniting conversation. Hey guys, what's up? It's me, your girl, your host, Elena Grace, and that means that y'all are listening to another episode of I've Been Thinking. So thank you for that, as always. Um, Happy June. Happy Pride Month. Um, I'm sure June is lots of other things, but I cannot think of them right now. So on that note, just happy June in general. Um, I'm really excited about today's episode, okay, because I have actually had this topic this episode on my mind for as long as I've had the podcast so a year um a little over a year because I started working on it before I actually launched it but anyway long story short um yeah I'm just really excited to share this with you guys today rather than a book of the month because you know usually the first day of the month we do a book of or the first episode of the month we do a book of the month right so I really love those. I love, love, love doing those. And I love sharing that with you and talking about books with you. But I know that that's not always y'all's favorite. Um, So I thought I would mix it up a little bit this week, okay, or this month. And we're doing a movie of the month instead. So I think that this is really fun. I'm going to start mixing this in for books of the month, occasionally doing a movie of the month, that kind of thing where I talk about, you know, a movie. So today, I'm going to talk about Blade Runner, all right? This, like I said, this topic's been on my mind for over a year, and I'm finally finding the right words, I guess, in the right space and timing to share it with y'all, and I'm so freaking excited, okay? So I took my senior year of college in 2017, I went to a private university and we had this thing there called May term where like semesters, like your normal semester um, was a little bit shorter than the average semester um, for us. And then at the end of the year, our graduation was always a little bit later. It was always like Memorial Day weekend. Um, excuse me so we had a month after so regular classes ended like early April and then um we would have a few days off and then we would have May term and so it's a one month class that you take and it's like every day you go to this class instead of like three days a week or two days a week or whatever every day you go to this class and it's a full credit you get Transy doesn't do hours, it does credits. So this class is a full credit. Anyway, long story short, it was a full class. You go every day. And I very poetically, because I'm 
dramatic and poetic and romanticizing everything I do, I was like, I am going to take a class, my very last class of college, with my very first professor of college. She was my August term professor because we used to have this thing called August term where it was the same concept, but just freshmen, just first years. So anyway, took this class with Dr. Ellen Cox. She is a dream. I adore her so much. And she thought it was so precious that I did that. She was like, that's so poetic. And I was like, yeah, bitch, I know. I did it on purpose. She loved it. But I was, I was also the only senior in that class. So I was this old lady sitting in the corner <laughs> with inside jokes with the professor and everybody else was like, what? Anyway, so it was philosophy and film. And that class was incredible. I absolutely loved it. And we literally spent a week out of that three and a half week long course talking about Blade Runner. I'm pretty sure we watched it in class and then we discussed the ethics of artificial intelligence for a week. And that was just so, so awesome. So all of that to say, I'm super excited to share this with you all. Um, okay, so Blade Runner was released in 1982. It was directed by Ridley Scott. And it's a dystopian cyberpunk noir detective movie that holds a place in history as one of the best sci-fi movies ever made. And it's also kind of a cult classic, but not in the way that, like, it's a bad movie, so people love it. It's, like, a great movie, so people love it, you know? Um, but actually, upon its original release, it was a box office flop. People didn't like it in the 80s. But in 2007, I think, they re-released the director's cut, Ridley Scott had full artistic control over it. And at that point, people were like, oh, wait, holy shit. This is so good. Like, this is so good. So, I don't I don't know if the director's cut had a direct correlation with it becoming, like, the best sci-fi movie ever made or if both versions are considered like incredible but the director's cut is just like way 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 better I don't know I can't answer that question for you maybe you can answer that question for me let me know if you know um yeah so let me set the scene for you okay in case you've not seen it or in case you need a little refresh because you know sometimes we need a little refresh a little fresh fresh so the movie is set in 2019 Los Angeles and you know in 1982 that was a long ways away, you know? So the world is polluted, accurate, overpopulated, accurate, and everyone in it is consumed by technology. Accurate. Wow. The elites are still rich white men, no surprise there, and the poor are migrants and trade workers dredging through dirty streets and dirty air fighting for survival. So, yeah accurate. There's no sun hitting the surface of the earth anymore, though, thanks to pollution clouds that just completely smother out the light. All animals are dead, pretty much. Um, cars fly. Humans are colonizing planets other than earth. Off-world colonies, they call them. And androids called replicants or replicants but it's always enunciated as replicants. I, I don't know. Anyway, they're being produced to serve as off-world slave labor, personal servants, and also sex slaves. Oh, that's fun. Our main character, the anti-hero kind of dude Richard Deckard, a.k.a. Harrison Ford in the real world, my man, Indiana Jones, I mean, an absolute dream. Um, he is asked to come out of retirement and come back to his job as this kind of police officer bounty hunter situation called a Blade Runner. That is a name that I will be completely honest with you. I will never, I have never understood. Why is that the name? Why is that the title Blade Runner? What does that have to do? 
with anything. I don't get it. Don't get it. All right. But his job is to hunt replicants that are illegally hiding on Earth and retire, aka mark them. Okay. So here's the tea. Replicants, so they're illegal on Earth. Specifically, these, like this specific iteration of them, um, because they're very, very developed and they're very, they look like humans. They can pass as humans, right? So the T is that the replicants specifically that he's hunting have come to Earth illegally. They're led by our homeboy, Roy, and they're trying to increase their four-year lifespan to that of a, quote, real humans. So their developers built this four-year lifespan in as a fail-safe because these are the most advanced iteration of replicants yet, and they look like humans, they talk like humans, they're even given, a lot of them are given false memories so that they can, like, talk to you and kind of relate to you and make you feel like you're having a real human experience, okay? So the developers knew that or they kind of figured they had an idea that these replicants were so advanced that they might begin to develop their own emotional responses eventually thus the built-in lifespan so that like even if they did start to develop something they would just fall over and i guess they figured that like Anything more than four years, they would start figuring things out and start having emotions and, you know, that kind of thing. But under that, maybe it would be harder to develop emotions in that amount of time. I don't know if you kind of think about it. Well, no, toddlers are all emotion, so that's really not a good example. Okay, anyway. um, So, Roy and his crew are trying to undo that lifespan. They're trying to... Uh, go to their creator, Tyrell, the owner of the corporations. He's like crazy, but the owner of the corporations that produce the replicants, he they want to go to him and say like, hey, we want to live longer, right? So Roy and his crew, they've begun to develop thoughts and feelings of their own, and they want to be human, and they want to live. Now, this brings up some major questions and some major issues, right? We'll get into that. Don't worry. So the opening scene of Blade Runner is an extremely close-up shot of an eyeball, right? And it shows the pupil dilating. And at first, all you see is a dark void in the black of the pupil. But then in the reflection, we can see the dark shadows and the flying cars of Los Angeles. And this just begins the questioning, right? And this carries through because the eye is heavily used as symbolism throughout the film. Um, like the way the replicant's eyes create a kickback glow, like, like a flash um, if light hits them or something like that. This was purposeful by Ridley Scott and the writers because they wanted to create a sense of artificiality when you looked at these very human-looking androids, right? Further, it highlights the idea that the eye does not just see, it also shows. And this is super relevant to that opening scene as well, because a lot of people argue that the dark void of the dilated pupil is to show the emptiness of the soul of the replicants, like the fact that they don't have a soul, technically, arguably, questionably. Um, because technically they shouldn't have a soul because technically they're artificial beings. But that's the whole dilemma. Do or can replicants have souls? Now, the eye is also super instrumental in the movie because of its importance in making memories, right? Replicants are often given false memories, kind of make them seem more human, like I said, make them be able to make conversation, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I guess just make the humans who are interacting with them feel 
more normal about interacting with a creation. <laughs> like a clone, a monster, you know? Like to take that idea away, take away the idea that you're talking to a robot um, and make it feel like a real connection. So there are scenes where replicants talk about their memories and you're like, oh no, honey, that's a fake memory that was implanted because they don't know. A lot of the time they don't know, right? But there are scenes where replicants share about the real memories they've made. In one scene, Roy, our main replicant, he tell he's talking to the man who designed his eyes. His name is Chu. And he says, Chu, if only you could see what I've seen with your eyes. Which is sort of like a joking double entendre because they kind of are Chu's eyes, right? Since he made them. Um, but there's a more iconic moment in the movie that has stuck with me since the very first time I saw it. My senior year of college, like I said, in 2017, which is crazy. But that is the Tears and Rain monologue. So this monologue is the last words of Roy. Again, the head honcho of the Replicant Rebellion that Deckard Harrison Ford has been ordered to quell. So one critic actually described this monologue as perhaps the most moving death soliloquy in cinematic history, which explains why it has stuck with me for so long. I mean, rent-free in my head. It will never have to pay rent. It's so good. So this is almost, it takes place at almost the end of the movie after Deckard has been chasing Roy across rooftops and they're jumping from rooftop to rooftop. Roy has like super human, super strength, because he's not a human, he's super strength. Um, so he makes this jump, Deckard misses it, and he f almost falls off the roof and he's holding on for dear life. And this there's this whole suspenseful, like two minute scene where Roy is deciding, like, this man's hunting me. Should I just let him fall and be done with it, or should I help him? Like, my time's running out. His literal timer is running out, and he has to make the decision. And he uses one of the last things he has left on this world to do to help him, to help Deckard off the roof. And... Roy turns around and he gives them this, oh, how the tables have turned moment. And Deckard is shocked. But Roy realizes that he's about to die no matter what. So he starts reflecting on the experiences of his mortal life. He says, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. Even more symbolic at this point, he has, like I said, they're on the roof. He's got a dove that he's like found on the roof and he's cradling it in his hands. And so... When Roy's time expires, he lets go of the dove, and the dove is freed, and so is Roy. Now, these words were a reflection of Roy's desire to have, you know, a mark on existence. According to Howard, he was one of the writers, editors, he wanted, Roy wanted to have a mark. He wanted to have existed, right? These were his experiences, his memories, and they were the things that drove his desire to continue living. These things fueled his thirst for life. And really, how relatable is that? How, how similar does that feel and sound? Because my experiences, my memories, and those of other people, the, you know, hearing about their experiences and memories, those things, oh, I love them. And I, it makes me want to live and to experience more, right? And who doesn't want to have a mark 
on the world when their time comes. And that's what Roy wanted too. That was why he wanted to live. He had a thirst for life. Now, a major philosophical point of this film can be found in Rene Descartes' 17th century musings, which, even more poetic, my first class of transy, my first class of undergrad, with that professor who I, had, I took philosophy and film with, my very last class at transy, um... We studied Descartes, so isn't that funny? The way it came full circle and how much it relied on Descartes. It's just insane. But anyway, um, Rene Descartes was a 17th century philosopher. And he mused on the idea of what makes a human, right? And that's basically what the whole film is about. Like in a nutshell, in the tiniest little tight nutshell you can imagine, it's about what makes you human. So Descartes says that when he's watching out a window and he sees humans passing by on the street below him, he sees hats and cloaks, quote, hats and cloaks that might cover artificial machines whose motions might be determined by springs, end quote. Very ahead of his time, that one. But the point is that by just looking at a person or a being or someone who looks like a person, It doesn't tell you that they're human. It doesn't tell you who or what they are, which we can apply today in many ways. I mean, Happy Pride Month, you can't just look at somebody and know, oh, they're gay, oh, they're straight, oh, they're trans, oh, they're whatever. You can't just look at somebody and know them, you know? You can't judge a book by its cover truly. Furthermore, by even by interacting with someone, that doesn't prove their humanity. Just because somebody plays a part, it doesn't prove who or what they are, you know? You have to really get to know someone. You have, it takes a lot more than just an interaction to understand somebody, right? And here's the thing, okay? If the defining difference between humans and replicants is the ability to emote, then a lot of the quote-unquote real humans in this movie don't live up to that standard. Tyrell, the Jeff Bezos times 100-esque villain who runs the city, basically, and owns the company that produces the replicants, he's a terrible person. He's an awful, awful person. Deckard, our anti-hero who truly believes at first that he's doing the right thing just because he's following orders and doing like the lawful thing, He's like lawful neutral for a lot of the movie. Um, He is emotionless and he's distant from all other humans. But we see Deckard begin to warm up when he starts to have feelings towards Rachel, a legal replicant employee of Tyrell that Deckard has befriended. But even then, Deckard's like, well, I'm having feelings. I don't know how to deal with it and pushes her away. Now, interestingly... And with much parallel to Roy, Deckard is now beginning to question what's been programmed into him by society, in Deckard's case, um, and by his bosses, also in Deckard's case. Whereas Roy was programmed literally by programmers, Deckard's questioning society. He's beginning to soften his ideas and to question and to be kinder and to let himself feel emotions and appreciate them. In By doing that, he started to become human himself. And this is a major point, okay? Like, when I finished watching this movie the first time, I was like, "Mm, what? So is Deckard a replicant himself? I'm really sorry for that horrible noise. That was just, I'm sorry. But that's how I felt, right? And it turns out this question kind of ends up getting answered in the sequel that came out in 2017. I think it got answered there from what I understood. But that's a major point in the first movie is that you have to question Deckard. And he questions himself. He's like, am I a replicant? Is anything I remember real? Am I a human? What the hell? 
And you know, his moral ambiguity is another major plot line because he's struggling to understand himself. He's struggling to understand his identity outside of what society and his bosses have programmed to, to be. And when he starts to feel emotions and humanness, when he starts to feel attached to Rachel, the replicant, he's confused. And he's especially confused because Rachel feels emotions for him too. So where's the difference between them? Now, I do want to point out one kind of major difference between replicants and humans that isn't really made a big deal of, in my opinion, in the movie. But one author that I read an article of his, actually, I think it was like a high school essay that was posted on like their website, Uh, but it was good. I liked it. It brought up some really cool points. So Sebastian Bloom, here's to you. Um, But he presents the argument that because replicants are engineered, they can't choose what determines their character, which is what what differentiates them ultimately from human beings. The replicants were were programmed to fulfill a function and thus cannot truly be held responsible for their nature because it was engineered by someone else, right? Does that follow? Hopefully. Humans, on the other hand, are able to create our own nature through free choice, and thus we are responsible for it. Our actions are free to make, so we can't blame them on someone else. Now, this bl- this blames. This brings us to some of the huge religious parallels to be found in the movie, okay? So Roy, the replicant, has been compared to Jesus Christ uh, with Tyrell, his creator, of course, being the God father-like figure. Tyrell even calls Roy his prodigal son at one point because Roy goes off on his own outside of his creator's control. Plus, there's this whole question throughout the movie of free will and choice. And there's also this whole question in religion about free will and choice. Does God give us the ability to choose for ourselves or are we predisposed to make choices that all fall within the eventual culmination of his divine plan? Now, personally, I believe that we're made in God's image, not that God looks like us physically, because I don't think that you can give a creator being, you know, an all omniscient, omnipresent creator being um, that is essentially the universe in an ethereal sense. Anyway, I don't think you can give them a physical, you know, assigned look. I think that they can give themselves one, and it's probably always going to be different. Anyway, anyway, um, I believe that we're provided with the godlike abilities of choice and of emotion and love and freedom of thought and exertion of will and emotion. I don't remember if I said that already, but that's a major one. These things are godlike and our ability to choose whether or not we turn to God is important um, because that's a part of our free will and a part of our being like God. And otherwise, humankind was just created as an ego boost. And I don't think that's quite what it was. I still don't get it. I think maybe it's an experiment. But anyway, um, the fact that replicants are evolving to be able to act freely and to feel emotions and to make their own choices that fall outside of their programming, does that make them more human? Does that make them human-ish? Does that mean that they have a soul? Do the humans in this movie, who are all just kind of robotically going about their existence without thought or emotion, and they're just fulfilling society or their boss's expectations, you know, fulfilling their programming, Are they less human than these replicants who desire so badly to be human and to feel and exist? Furthermore, we have this huge issue of dehumanization of actual people through the rise of an increasingly capitalist, technology-focused society, where there becomes this obsession with human versus android replicant 
especially as the replicants become more advanced and the artificial intelligence gets to the point that it can eventually begin to feel and think for itself outside of its programming. And this creates these huge ethical issues of what makes a soul, what makes a human. And I mean, like I said, I focus for a fourth of a class on just this question. It, I don't think it can be answered. I think it's a very, a very personal um, situation, but I would love to know what y'all think. I'm not gonna answer any questions for you here because I don't have any answers. I think that also my opinion has probably changed over the years, but I still, I remember 21 year old baby Elena sitting in that classroom, sad and heartbroken and feeling just so sad for these people who just want to be so badly and feeling so related to that because damn it, if I don't want to just live, you know? So anyway, I would love to know what y'all think. If you've not watched this movie, go watch it and then let me know what you think. And if you have watched it before, tell me your thoughts right now. Do souls have to exist in a natural body? Can they evolve into existence in artificial intelligence? Does artificial intelligence scare and confuse you as much as it does me? Let me know. Write in. Comment. Leave me a review. Email me. I don't care. Let me know. Make sure that y'all are following wherever you listen and um, make sure that you're following on Instagram at I've Been Thinking Pod. That would be an awesome place to leave a comment and let me know what you thought about today's episode or what you think about replicants and created souls or if souls are created. Um, and yeah, check out the website, I've Been Thinking Pod.com. The sources from today's episode will be there as well as kind of a transcript, kind of. Um, and am I missing anything? Oh, let me tell you this real quick. If you've made it this far, congrats. Leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or on Facebook for the Facebook page for the podcast. And leave me the review, take a screenshot, email it or DM it to me, and I'll send you some free stickers because I would love that. I would be so grateful. And yeah, reviews are so, so helpful. So please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google probably. I think you can review there. It's kind of annoying you can't on Spotify. Anyway, all right, guys, thanks again so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode this week. And I'll talk at you next week with a special Pride episode and a special guest. Okay. Love you guys so much. Thank you again. Bye. Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder and I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org.